everyone. Glad to welcome everybody to this webinar. It's a special uh, webinar series uh, put together. It's the first in the series, actually, uh, of um, a webinars uh, put together by the Orange Academy uh, alumni group. And um, we're glad to have everyone join. Uh, so we have a good, well, we have a good <laughs> number of people here today. Um, so uh, I just want to encourage us to relax and uh, soak in the knowledge. And um, of course, uh, during the course of the webinar, the panel discussion, if you have questions, uh, feel free to use the uh, question and answer button or just um, type in your questions on the chat. Um, first, um, let me, for those of us who do not know, Orange Academy is Africa's first school of integrated brand experience. Orange Academy has been one of the leading um, uh, outlets to groom and train creative minds uh, in Nigeria. Uh, and then, of course, they go on to uh, create great influence, not just in Nigeria, beyond Nigeria, in Africa, and of course, um, uh, globally. So we are also happy to be leading such conversations uh, as this. Uh, we have our speaker ready, and of course, we have our panelists also ready. And one of the hallmarks of today's event is that it's going to be very, very direct, uh, no time wasting. Uh, I want to see how much we can mine in terms of uh, knowledge around the subject matter. And thankfully, all our speakers are ready. And um, so we won't want to waste uh, time. Um, our first speaker, or rather our keynote speaker today is um, somebody that is well known uh, in the industry across uh, the continent. Uh, he's uh, Mr. Femi Odubemi. He's an accomplished storyteller and content producer whose career has spanned uh, advertising, broadcasts, in filmmaking. He's a member of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences in the United States. Uh, Femi is a former president of the Independent Television Producers Association of Nigeria, IJPAN. He co-founded the IREP, uh, IREP Resent International Documentary Film Festival, Lagos. And he's a four-time head of jury of the prestigious AMVCAs, the Africa Magic Viewers' Choice Awards. He has also served as a three-time three head judge of the Uganda Film Festival uh, between 2012 and 2014, the juror of the British Council Shakespeare Leaves Project in 2016, juror of the Emmy Awards in New York 2012 and 2016, uh, among many other others. Femi's screen credits include Nigeria's longest running daily show, Tinsel, over 2,500 episodes and counting, uh, the critically acclaimed drama series Battleground, 460 episodes, and his most recent work, Brethren, with 260 episodes, all screened across the continent on the DSTV channels. He has also produced and directed feature films, including Morocco, 2006, Giddy Blues, 2016. Femi has, in addition, written and produced many critically acclaimed documentaries and issue-based films. In November 2013, he received the Excellence Award of the Society of the Performing Arts of Nigeria, SPAN, and received the prestigious Lifetime Achievement Award from the Nigeria Film Corporation in 2018. He is the Provost of Orange Academy, founder, CEO of Zuri 24 Media Lagos, and concurrently the Academy Director of the multi Joy Choice Factory. Uh, just before I bring up Femi, just want to, I think I missed this out. My name is Ugochuku Ezabula, and I'll be the moderator for today's event. I'm also uh, an alumnus of Orange Academy, IBX3, and I'm currently a member of the digital faculty. All right, so uh, I'm glad if I was in church, I would say, with a good God bless you, let's welcome. <laughs> uh, good to have you, sir. Uh, 
Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ugo. Um, I should say Pastor Ugo, so a good God bless you will not be out of out of place coming from you. Uh, but it's it's um, a real pleasure for me to be part of um, this conversation. And I, I really just want to thank the alumni of Orange Academy uh, for the opportunity to take part in this conversation. I really love the fact that our alumni uh, in Orange are trying to drive uh, important conversations uh, such as this, and especially at a time like this. And I think that's that's really very important. I've got only 20 minutes. So really, I, what I wanted to do is just put a, a, a sprinkle of thoughts and ideas out there that hopefully empower, um, you know, our co-panelists, you know, Kathleen and, and uh, Dayo, uh, who are perhaps deeper in how this uh, unfolds uh, than I. I. I really, truly believe we are having an interesting conversation at an interesting time uh, and the right conversation um, within the context of what we're about to enter, which is the new um, way of work. Uh, I, I want to amend our title a little bit for the purpose of the things I want to say. So instead of the creative economy, I want to, uh, the future of employment, I, I want to talk about the creative economy, and the future of work, because I think you know one of the things that um, we are going to find out in in this post COVID season is that uh, employment is is really um, a, an outdated term in terms of the idea that it it responds to a dynamic where we are paid for supplying labor services. And I think that's very important because whilst we will be paid um, to, to work in an environment or in a company or in a structure, uh, we will actually ultimately uh, not be employed in the sense that we used to remember it uh, because now uh, we are going to actually be working um, out of creating. And I think that's, that's very important. Um, what COVID has done is that for all of us, it's brought us to what you will consider an inflection point, a, a reflection point, which is why this conversation is so um, very important. We are all living through what you will call a fundamental transformation in the way uh, that we work and what the future of work looks like um, is, is a conversation that's very important because we can't be prepared for the future uh, if we don't understand it. So for me, I want to have this conversation in the context of COVID-19, the shifts that it has created, the crisis that it's actually and the fact that what you would consider the workplace trends uh, of old are shifting. And, and not just shifting, it's also increasing a demand for a different kind of workplace. Um, flexible hours, remote workers, hybrid work systems. Um, all of this that we introduced because we were in lockdown, I've, are going to become permanent features uh, of what the workplace looks like going forward. And, and it would become something where most workers are self-supervised, which is why the concept of employment uh, becomes arcane, um, simply because each worker actually self-supervised. Each worker um, contributes and creates and actually has to be connected to what the end goal of the work process is. And just to, to say, I think it's important that I quickly talk about, you know, three important things that I think we need to understand. COVID is forcing us to prioritize in the workplace. Um, it's, it's forcing us to prioritize productivity, not just process efficiency, 
not just you know uh, capacity to, um, to 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 police a system, uh, but to actually be productive, to actually have something that is an end goal to our role in a system. It's forcing productivity, but it's forcing productivity within the context of innovation as well. You you can't just do repetitive things anymore simply because um, almost any 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 uh, uh, robot now can be programmed to create automated you know con uh, automated roles to to take on automated roles to produce things that have the same specification the same uh, uh, you know uh, uh, front to back end uh, process. So effectively, it's, it's forcing us to prioritize imagination over automation. And beyond that, it's forcing us to prioritize learning, which means that you know, um, work experience is no longer going to be as important as our capacity um, in the experience of work. How much are we able to um, be flexible? Uh, how much are we able to take on multiple roles? How much are we able to contribute in areas of the, of the, of the, of the delivery chain that may not be our immediate specialization? The idea at the heart of it all will be imagination. At the heart of it all will be innovation. And I think that's, that's really um, very important. Because going forward, you will find that fewer people will have what you will call long-term employment. The whole concept of retirement um, is also uh -oh, is also going to become obsolete. I'm I'm absolutely sorry, but a generator will be turned on shortly. Um, the additional thing that I think is important to understand is that you know the comfort and welfare of, of workers will become also something of important priority. And, and working from spaces other than a, in a single environment will become a part of you know, what you call a permanent feature of our work life now. Why is all of this sort of important to, uh, to note? All of this has always been almost the nature of the creative industries, the nature of the creative economies. The creative economies has always prioritized imagination. The idea that it is your capacity to innovate that actually makes you relevant to, to its processes. Um, the, the creative industries has always prioritized uh, how interpret, in, interpretative, uh, 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 how will I call it, interpretative engagement. Um, rather than just you know, systems efficiency. Uh, the creative industries have always been about you know, finding a way to engage the consumer. Uh, so really, there is a way in which COVID has shifted everyone from however their industries were structured to how the creative economy has always functioned. And what that then says is, in this inflection point is that number one, we need to boost the creative component of every job specification. That, that's the first most important thing. The idea that whatever is the work that you are doing now, whatever is the function, whether it be in, in, you know, in medicine, in engineering, you have to figure out a way to create a story around it. Um, I was told that there is a, a doctor somewhere in St. Louis in, in America who really is a cancer is a, is a cancer um, physician. He's a, is a you know he, he deals with cancer patients, and he finds that when he's able to create a, an engaging story visually around the 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 um, you know the diagnosis the treatment options and the kind of outcomes that he envisages. There is a way in which his patients survived longer. Or to, to put it you know, more succinctly, the percentage of those who beat cancer 
um, who were his patients went higher once he was able to engage them in a narrative that takes what is a, a crisis and a disaster and sort of gives it a story arc that ends up with a testimony. Uh, so there is a way in which, first and foremost, every job specification in the new work environment would have to figure out a story, to build a story that engages the emotional capacities of consumers, of clients, of employees, of statutory authorities, and of course, the Sarah public. The idea being that the key to relevance in the new workplace will still uh, be our capacity to create a winning narrative, a winning story. The second thing that I think would be very critical is that we have to understand uh, that technology is going to be critical to how we drive solutions and that those solutions have to be personal, they have to be actionable, they have to be relevant to our immediate need, our immediate environment, our immediate tribes. Uh, for me, this is particularly very important for all of us who, 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 who live and work in what you call the developing or the underdeveloped economies. Um, we have to understand how we engage the Technology. We cannot continue to engage technology uh, from a, uh, how shall I say it, from almost, we have to engage technology from a conscious um, perspective where it is addressed, uh, not just, you know, uh, uh, from a compulsive use scenario, but from a conscious use scenario where it's actually addressed to everyday problem in the workplace where the convenience and capacity of our people uh, to bring technology to bear on improving their life, improving their decisions, improving everyday conveniences um, is really the goal. And for me, why I, I sort of stress this is that if you look at the numbers of Nigerian youth who are involved in technology and you look at the numbers uh, the, the areas of our country where technological solutions are required, um, you realize that if we were to actually be more conscious about application, if we were to be more conscious about cross fertilizations, um, we could actually create, you know, in, in, in incredibly powerful um, e economies that is built on the creativity and innovations that are providing solutions that address what we call today poverty. Because essentially a lot of what we call poverty comes from the fact that we have a lot of, uh, 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 you know, we have a lot of situations where we still are doing things um, the hard way. We still are paying more, you know, to get things that we could actually uh, do more efficiently, pay less if we applied technology. Uh, so for me, the, the new marketplace is a place where, you know, things like coding is something we would teach in school as a basic for young people, um, um, uh, you know, coming to awareness, just as, as we do mathematics or English or, 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 or sciences, because that would be the way to prepare them to bring technology solutions to what you would consider everyday problems. Uh, the third thing obviously is, is how do we drive ease of connectivity, especially in content distribution? Because essentially speaking, everything that we will be doing going forward is about also creating content. And, and I say that to say, Everything around the workplace would surround what is called the memory integrity. The idea that people need to have access, not just to, you know, uh, the, the systems and solutions, but, you know, to archive those solutions in ways that they can revisit it, share it, contribute to it in, a, in an online, offline loop. And I think that's really, where for us as a country with such a large population, um, it, it's, it's going to be key. 
how do we ensure that you know our memory integrity, our capacity to ensure that you know um, we're not constantly solving the same solution at uh, the same problem in many different ways all the time. And, and you can see that in the kind of conversations that we have on our social media. You can see that in the way that we run even our political systems. You can see that in our governance systems uh, because we, we tend to have um, many different identification numbers, but not one pool. You can't, you have a BVN, you have a, a national ID card, you have a, so basically you're, you're constantly solving the same problem with different applications because your memory integrity is poor. And I think that's really uh, perhaps uh, going forward what is going to be even more um, important for all of us. So I'm just gonna wrap up by saying that in the new marketplace, uh, ideas rule. This I think you know, uh, has been the, uh, uh, the foundational proposition of the Orange Academy that in the end, um, new ideas, um, reshaped ideas, uh, conflated ideas are really the foundational um, uh, driver of prosperity, of innovation, of productivity. And, and the creative industries as we used to know it is now really every industry because in medicine, you know, imaging and imagery has become a very critical part of diagnosis. Um, MRIs have become, you know, a critical tool in not only identifying what the problems is medically, but also in being able to explain it to the patient in, in, in such a way that the patient has enough energy, enough, uh, 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 you know, uh, enough uh, motivation to actually overcome, you know, whatever is is the medical challenge, but also you look in, you look in uh, engineering, you look in, in, in government, you look in any part, uh, any kind of uh, areas of human endeavor, the capacity to create, to narrate, to build a story that connects to the consumer's emotional engagement is become uh, uh, important and, 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 and very, very much a priority. Uh, so going forward, innovation obviously will, will outpace regulation. Uh, digital platforms will become, you know, more specialists. And as I've said, there'll be more and more niche, you know, uh, niche uh, solution providers, um, which will also allow, you know, uh, much younger businesses to flourish. Uh, of course, I've also said that ideas will serve more in the personalization of service delivery um, than ever before. So concepts like, you know, distribution, concepts like, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, point of sale, concepts like how we engage consumer, concepts like how we sell, you know, both physically and online are going to constantly be redefined simply because um, the consumer too has become a part of the story uh, story structure. They, they, there are a lot of content now online that are consumer generated. There's a lot that is authorial um, through expertise, but much more we find that actual sustainable innovation and idea generation comes through almost a cross fertilization of the curatorial or the authorial and the experiential, which is the part of the story structure that is supplied by our consumers and our clients. And so really uh, in concluding the future of work for all of us will be how we respond. Um, because as I say to people, uh, COVID-19 and, and, and what's come off of that basically has posed a lot of questions questions to systems, questions about expertise, questions about service delivery, questions about you know, what we promise the consumer and what we promise the process of productivity and economy across all our, our, um, you know, our, 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 our work systems. So the, 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 the future of work will be how we create solutions to what you would consider to be, you know, 
our everyday workplace uh, uh, purpose. Um, I'm going to let us, you know, just, just, just break this down a little bit more, but really for me, I find that we are in what you will call a decisive moment. And a decisive moment, um, I, I, when I think about it, I, I think about, you know, uh, the children of Israel in the Bible and how it described, you know, the men of Issachar. And what distinguished them was that they, they were men who knew their times and therefore knew what to do, understood the times and therefore knew what to do. And all that says is that we are also at a decisive moment where we not only have to understand our times, we have to embrace it. And, and clearly be aware that, you know, the way of work previous to now um, will not be the, the most efficient way of work going forward. Attached to that as well is how we build teams, how we collaborate, how we connect, uh, you know, the dots of different industries to the capacities uh, of the creative industry, the creative economy, you know, for ideation, for innovation, and obviously um, for that emotional engagement that makes, you know, all of this uh, ever more impactful and, and, and profitable. Um, thank you very much. And I look forward to engaging in this conversation that, that follows. Well, thank you very much for that uh, very incisive uh, uh, presentation. Uh, as always, <laughs> as always, we, I mean, I enjoyed every bit of it. And most importantly, I think you put out a beautiful nugget that we should ponder on. And thankfully, we have um, um, very great minds here that would um, all help us distill this subject further. I mean, before I call call them up, I just need want to summarize, you know, a bit some of the things you you touched on, and you said something very instructive. You said the creative industry is now every industry. In other words, every industry is going to experience needs a level of uh, creative input, you know, uh, whether it's in the medical sciences or you know engineering. Uh, you need the level of some form of um, storytelling embedded in uh, all of some of our activities. Uh, and you said technology is important. Uh, technology is very important you know, when we are creating solutions. And so it's important also that uh, we drive, we bring conversations around how we can drive connectivity, you know, connectivity. So this speaks about access speaks about access, you know, it speaks about also creating, you know, we talk about um, uh, democratization, leveling, uh, leveling the environment for everybody, you know, connectivity is very, very critical now. Uh, and then also you said that ideas rule the marketplace. So it's not so, so much about, and, 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 and that's a very interesting one because I'm going to ask some questions around uh, this. And you talked also about um, the fact that innovation will outpace regulation. Innovation will outpace regulation, and um, I'm going to pick you up on that. Just you know, but I will, before we do that, I want to ask. Um, I, will, I want to invite our uh, other panelists uh, to join us. Uh, first person I'm going to be inviting is uh, uh, Dayo Adefila. Dayo is a long-standing marketing and communications leader with two decades worth of experience, helping to build great brands and drive commercial success. He had successfully. He had successful stints as head of copy at Inside Communications, head of strategy at Inside Communications before becoming co-founder at Hot Sauce, one of Nigeria's pioneer and innovative digital agencies. Today, in his role as head digital marketing for Africa at leading FMCG PZ Cousins, Dio is helping to turn digital into a driver of marketing ROI across Africa. Dio's professional philosophy has always been that greater success lies with being truly customer-centric in action, and not just on paper. He used to write science fiction. He used to. <laughs> All right, so welcome, uh, Dio. <laughs> hi, Dio. <laughs> good to hi, have you. Hi, how you go? How you doing? Yeah, good to have you here. Um, Thank I also you very much. Yeah, Kathleen. Kathleen is, um, Kathleen and Dong Mo is an entrepreneur and communication expert with a 20-year career trajectory focusing on brands, business, and digital media. She has worked in several industries, media, telecoms, banking, 
transport, sustainable development, tech, and so on. Executing projects in the private and public sector. Kathleen is principal officer of Anchor uh, Consulting, a management strategy, marketing, and digital media consulting firm that she founded in 2011. She is also a distinguished alumni of the U.S. State Department's uh, International Visitor Leadership Program and a fellow of the Open Internet for Democracy Program. Uh, hi, Kathleen. Oh, you, you're muted. Well, just like you, I start off on a bad note. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> hi, how are you? It's I'm great good. to be here amongst some of the most brilliant creative minds in Nigeria. So thanks yeah. for having me. Yeah, you can see that the gam farms in as well. Right? It's great to be associated. Um, uh, by the way, yeah, we're welcome first of nature. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, so so I mean, I'm sure you 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 listen into, but I, I want to start with Mr. Femi, and uh, I'm sorry, yeah, Mr. Femi, and uh, there was a particular point you talked about, you know, where you said innovation will outpace regulation and what re that resonates greatly you know with uh, uh, even our current situation in nigeria i think that's what is currently happening so we seemingly have a crop of leaders and um, regulatory agencies that really do not even understand uh, the, the pace of innovation and um, and that is actually making them you know try to slow the younger population down now, I want to start with you, Mr. Femi. Can you talk a bit about how we can, um, uh, how we can uh, scale through this hurdle? You know, this hurdle, unfortunately, in other climates, these are, these are not the challenges they have. But unfortunately, in our case, it's like uh, the people who are supposed to push us are the ones actually uh, slowing things down. What do, you, what, what do you have to say to that? Well, first of all, let me say hi to Chisholm. Uh, I see Chisholm, he pops in, he pops out. That's the managing director of uh, Orange Academy and the chief yeah, culprit. Me, <laughs> creating more and more. <laughs> welcome. I, I think it's important to understand that there is no economy that moves forward if regulation is outpacing innovation. And, and that's really as simple as that, because innovation is driven by, you know, great thinkers, individual thinkers who are finding solutions ahead of, of whatever is the current paradigm. Um, regulators assess current paradigms. Um, and the problem with that is they go from uh, understanding regulation to mean policing the current paradigms. When in fact, regulation in the new work environment, it's about promoting evolving paradigms and understanding the evolving paradigms for their capacity to create more employment, to create new ideas, new ways of working. And the problem with regulators is they tend to you know, sort of like dig in. <laughs> and when they dig in, they actually are applying yesterday's medicine to tomorrow's ailments. And we've seen that. I, I don't want to say anything about Twitter because I think that's really what you're trying to make me say. But I will say this. If, if, if the people banning Twitter banned it through Twitter. And, and that tells you the irony of regulation and innovation. And so there is a way in the new um, economy that we have to understand that um, you don't create a Steve Jobs through government patronage. You don't create Microsoft, you know, through a government um, uh, decree. It is that individual um, enterprise that um, regulation needs to put laws and stuff to drive it forward, not to hold it back. That's really what I meant. All right, thank you very much. Uh, by the way, let me put it out there. It wasn't even, it's beyond Twitter. It's, um, it's something that has, is a trend that has, uh, that maybe Twitter just uh, became like a climax. So you remember the story of um, the, the uh, cryptocurrency, the ban of crypto by uh, 
CBN and all that. And um, also, if you look at you know some other sectors, you see that, uh, for instance, um, insurtech is is really slowed down in Nigeria because of regulatory bottlenecks. You know, I've been involved in I've been involved in an insurtech hackathon that you know brilliant ideas came up. And then when it came to the point of putting these ideas to the market, you know, regulatory bottlenecks, you know, kind of like came up and then that just killed all those ideas. And these are ideas, you know, uh, InsurTech is, is, is striving so much in Europe, you know, and other regions of the world. So I think in the, the Twitter is just the one that affects, that similarly affects everybody and then it brings everything to the fore. But beyond that, I think uh, our leaders successively have uh, uh, shown a lack of, um, um, I say, uh, intelligence in terms of knowing the direction that uh, innovation is going. Um, okay, I, I, I'll come to uh, Dior. Um, so we've seen that the technology is obviously enabling disruption in the creative economy, you know, obviously. And then of course, we, what post-COVID is doing is actually bringing that to the fore the more. I always say to people that COVID-19 was not the beginning. All this has always existed. But now the speed at which people are now embracing these disruptions is kind of like faster post-COVID. Uh, but the question I have is, is this, would this really be, is this really a threat to establish ways of value creation? You know, uh, the disruptions that we are seeing in the creative economy, is it really a threat or is it something that uh, sectors, industries can actually leverage uh, to, to make for, uh, better productivity. Okay, um, thanks, Hugo. My, 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 my assessment of uh, the impact of COVID-19, you know, the, pan, uh, the, the pandemic is that it, it, it's a catalyst that, hasn't, that has no intentions of uh, running out of steam, right? It, it, it's a catalyst that has injected itself into the very fabric of how uh, even our psychology, how we think as people, what we open ourselves up to, what we believe we can do. And because we as people are what's also become customers for businesses, you find that that, that fundamental change and shift in how our relationship with, with privacy and data has changed. Right? There was a time when everybody was thinking, privacy, privacy, I don't want to give my data. I can't count how many you know, things I have freely given my emails and phone numbers to in the last one year, either because I want to learn something, train, or whatever it is. Right. So I don't think it's, it's, it's um, a disruption that is going to, to stop. You know, uh, the analogy will have been to say, if you have a self-winding toy that you, you know, you to start and then you expect that at some point it will run out of steam. I think this is going to be something that, because it has penetrated into every facet of life, right? Uh, the ripples will just keep evolving, right? You spoke about um, insure tech, right? So it, has, it is catalyzing and accelerating all of these things. There will always be break-even points. There will always be points where uh, you know, you you get to critical mass in some of those changes, and then you know how it is. The adoption life cycle, you know, more people get in, but it has fundamentally changed a lot of things, right? Um, if I may say a word, you know, about the conversation around innovation and and regulation, and you know, given our context here, you know, so my my my, my observation is also is that one, it's not new, right? You know. It's been there for you know for decades, and it's also not too peculiar to Nigeria. To be to be frank, the the difference is in the the ability of of the people we call regulators to to take a step back and you know consult with with the industries that are involved, <clears throat> you know consult with them before taking certain actions. Right, you know I think that is one of the things that helps that could help prevent what we may call, you know, a sudden reaction, you know, that seems to, you know, you know, clamp down on things, right? But, but, but then again, look, it is when there is controversy that sometimes these changes happen. 
for good or for bad, right? So, so I think the encouragement to give authorities is to say, look, when you discover, and look at the CBN example you gave, right? First, there was a crackdown, this and that. But now we've heard directly that there will be a digital currency from the CBN, CBN in, in, you know, before the end of the year. And this is in line with other global trends. So I think we, we should also recognize that, you know, <laughs> like Uncle Femi said, you know, Steve Jobs, you know, didn't emerge, you know, won't emerge from a government-based way of thinking. It's just, you know, inevitable that it's not going to happen like that, right? All we want to encourage these authorities is to say, look, engage with the industries because collaborative engagement is actually the way to make things, this, this kind of wave to be positive, not, not a disruptive engagement where it's just, you know, I, I stop you, you know, go back, but collaborative, give room, give some time to understand, oh, we never had a clue about this kind of stuff. Okay, uh, what is, <laughs> you know, how is it going to affect us? So I understand their, their concerns as well, but they should be more collaborative, right? And we also, as, as people that create or innovate, you know, also should try to understand that, look, for this set of people, it's often a shock to them because they've prepared in a certain way, like Uncle Femi said, they've prepared medicine for certain identified, you know, you know things to treat. And then suddenly there's, there's something completely new that they never knew. And suddenly that new thing is being used by 10 million, 20 million people. And it's like, you know, what do we do? So I think collaborative engagement is, is, is really one of the, the takeaways from the pandemic that will help us have a more positive outcome. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Collaborative engagement, and that's key. There, there is a gap that needs to be bridged, obviously. Uh, and then um, that has to be done. Okay, coming to you, uh, uh, Kathleen. Um, I think the last point, one of the last points that um, Femi made, uh, we, we talked about the future of work, you know, uh, that I talked about how you can, uh, the future of work will be how we create solutions to problems in the workplace. Um, in other words, that tells me that beyond your skill, your, you know, primary skill as it were, there are some competencies that will be required for you to be able to, to try. And this is bringing it back to the individual now when we're talking about uh, the creative economy and the future of employment. So uh, can you throw some light on some of those competencies that will be the hallmark of um, work as we know it, you know, in this post-COVID era? Ugo, um, that's, a, that's a great question. And um, I just want to say before I jump in it that Sir Femi has touched every single facet, you know, of this conversation in a really all encompassing way that, you know, you could come in and just take out some of the points and, and just expand them. So there's, maybe you have to have this conversation over many times because there's so much to dig into. And I want to answer your question using a story because I, I mean, Sir Femi is right. Stories are just the bane of um, understanding the pictures that we want people to understand. Um, someone shared a tweet a couple of weeks ago and asked a question and he said, um, can you remember um, the last time you were interviewed remotely? Um, and when was that? And that made me cast my mind back. My first job outside of Cameroon, and by the way, I'm Cameroonian, and I like to have Pan-African conversation, right? I'm Cameroonian Nigerian. So I've been in Nigeria for 13 years, and Nigeria loves me, and I love Nigeria. <laughs> so my first opportunity outside of Africa, I had it on the phone. So literally, I went online. I was looking for an opportunity. I was one of these young, frustrated Africans who was looking for an opportunity um, beyond the shores of my country. Because I felt like, oh, my country doesn't want me. I have talent, but they don't want me. And I went online, applied for this opportunity. And at that time, we were using these two by four phones. <laughs> this was in, in 2000. So we're talking about 21 years ago. And um, I got a call. I was interviewed on that phone. I was interviewed twice. I had tests by email and I was finally given an offer and I went off to England and spent a year working for this organization. So when I responded, people were like, 
21 years ago, you actually had a remote interview? And I said, yes. And this is the beauty of the creative economy. We think that this is an economy that is new. I, I, want, to, I want to kind of dispel that a little bit because even in the 19th century manufacturing industry, we did have those aspects Sir Femi has been talking about, innovation, you know, creativity, and the ability to iterate and scale. So, I mean, <laughs> you know, so, um, and the beauty about um, the, the creative economy and the opportunity. So I know that Sir Femi, you know, he fixed it on work. I want to expand it a little bit and, and, and push it out to opportunity because that's kind of like where it is going for a lot of people. And I'm focusing on the 420 million 15 to 35 year old young people on the continent who um, a third of them are either unemployed or vulnerably employed. And I'm thinking, hang on a second, what is going to happen when stakeholders come together and literally take approaches that are responsive, proactive, not reactive <laughs> as we see, you know, to the issues that our people are facing. Because we're talking about an economy, we're not talking about an industry, you know. And so to answer your question, I think that different stakeholders need to acquire different capacities. Um, and I think also that it's important not to reinvent the, the, the wheel. So if you are government, the capacity that you need to be acquiring must be in line with handshakes that will occur with the different talents, the different stakeholders, the different, you know, industries and people and organizations and sectors that will literally give you the umbrella to drive policy, to drive regulation, you know, to drive governance that meets the needs of the people. If you are civil society organization, totally different um, uh, capacities, but also they meet, you know, they, they kind of a conflict somewhere. For individuals, for the private sector, I'm trying to make this a bit short because I don't want to take too much time, but for the private sector, it's totally different. So by the time you're moving from banking to telecom, I think that it's important for organizations to, like Sir Femi said, to embed in their processes, these different necessary capacity. And I don't know why we keep calling it soft skills, guys. It's not soft skills now. <laughs> it's, it's, for me, and the, the way I see it, and I might be completely wrong, it is necessary skills. Whether you like it or not, increasingly, it's becoming survival skills. And I want to touch on one other point that I think it's important for us to look at. Before, so there is, who is even addressing and engaging the next billion users who are at the fringes, you know, of access, what Dio said. Those people who don't have access to con connectivity, those people who don't have access to internet, those people who have dot phones, who don't have smartphones. I know organizations that are literally you know, creating and innovating and building impactful stories around using IVR, you know, to get messages out to those populations and to ensure that those people are able to use knowledge and information to also make better decisions, you know, for their lives. And I know of an organization called Viamo that did this during the, 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 the pandemic. They literally sent out billions of messages um, on by IVR to millions of people and they're continuing to do that about the pandemic and how it can help. Guess what? All of these things that these organizations are doing are actually creating opportunity. You can literally beat that. Thank you. Wow, see why we call her force of nature. <laughs> and she took the conversation and they just tore it apart. You know, she, you know what, what I like about what Kathleen did is that Kathleen took, she, she took the conversation from uh, uh, what, uh, uh, 
uh, Uncle Femi started with. You, she kind of, she did as if she was arranging it. And then all of a sudden, she just started writing. <laughs> you know, but, but very brilliant stuff. Very, very brilliant stuff. I always whisper to people and I say, uh, Kathleen is the best president Cameroon is yet to have. You know, I can't imagine her being the president. <laughs> Um, <laughs> you know, I, I got on, I accidentally got on a project with Kathleen, you know, I accidentally got on a project with her. And prior to that time, I had been following her on Twitter. And then, then I got on that project. And after that project, I just said to myself, I just acquired a sister. I cannot. This one must not leave me. You know. All right. So I want to bring it back to and uh, Uncle Dio. Uh, let me ask you, what's the role of um, what's the role that emerging technology is going to play in this um, regard? We're talking, speaking about the creative economy. Now, some people have. Sorry. Hello, go. Hello, go. Yes. Um, there's a question in the question and answer area. Maybe uh, yeah, I'll pick that. I'll pick that. check it. I'll pick that. All right. I'll okay. pick that. You just little, uh, okay. So the the what role do you see emerging technologies playing in this regard? I mean, in terms of the creative economy. Now, some have said, look, this emerging technology could be a threat. You know, speaking about artificial intelligence, you know, and all that, it could be a threat to the creative economy. Do you think that is, and what is your own take on that? What is the role of emerging technology in the creative economy? Is it a collaborative role or is it, uh, uh, I don't know, I don't know, is it just completely disruptive role? Okay, so you guys are looking for all the hard mass questions that you want to be asking here today. <laughs> Okay, so um, hmm. the jury is not not yet out, right? But I will give my opinion. Right? Uh, at the end of the day, right? Technology will always complement, you know, facilitate something. Uh, because even the starting point for what you know the AIs and all of that is human thinking, human human conceptualization of what is needed to make something, usually to make something easier. You know, most AI things are trying to strip away complexity in either understanding something, a process, knowledge of how to do something, you know. And uh, my, 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 my thought is always that, look, we should always, first of all, understand the, the context of our experience. What are the needs in that environment and then go in inward you know and that's how the creative process really is right understand that context and then look for the ways to solve it you know if we start to prioritize looking at the the tools the platforms the challenges you know we will likely just become you know sub suboptimal right because platforms technologies they will change they will be changing like that right today you have this level of robotics tomorrow is this there was a time you remember a couple of years back, IoT was a big boss. Is it that IoT has died or what? No, it has just evolved. In fact, it's been accelerated in a way that we don't even think about IoT anymore. But the level of interconnectivity between the apps that we use, online physical apps, Nest, this and that, IoT has emerged. So, um, my, um, and let me use it a bit to kind of, because I peeped at, at you know, um, uh, Balaji's uh, of, of creative economy, you know. See, the thing is, there are huge opportunities, but what we call creative also is very broad, right? What we call creative is very broad. But you see, the application of thought to a solution in a certain way is, is generally how you see something is creative. So let me give some examples, right? Think about it. Let me speak about people that, that are working organizations. And this is the pandemic period. And we're having hybrid working. There's one huge thing that is kind of missing for many organizations today. What is that? Brainstorming. The ability to have brainstorm sessions together has been cut down because of the effect of the pandemic, right? 
So what do you do? And you are losing a very vital component of, especially if you're in marketing or you're in product development. If you don't have, if you don't have the ability to have brainstorming sessions with your teams, it's a huge component of project management and creative development that has been left out. What is available? Some people have created visual project management tools that can be used, Kanban boards and, and all of this kind of stuff. So if, if your people cannot meet physically, you can use that electronically and teach them how to use whiteboards. That's the foundation of, 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 of ideas generation. So it, it's going to be back to, yes, let me go back to what, what Kathleen was talking about, different industries, different sectors, having to understand you know, what is needed there. If it's educational, look at what the guys at U-Lesson are doing with, with, with you know, remote education. It is crazy. They went very fast from just, oh, are we just going to give you Zoom uh, alternative to educational lessons? And they're going on and on. And of course, they have a vision. My point is, you know, we are likely not going to be able to cover all of it, right? But if we say, take this sector, think about what are the challenges, what are the opportunities there? What are the creative ways to help that industry break its challenges? There are so many solutions there. So many, so many. Consumer engagement, you think about conversational uh, things that have to facilitate conversations with consumers, right? Okay, so you have the WhatsApps, the chatbots and things like that. Some people I know have got into creating chatbots because it helps to facilitate engagement and conversations properly with consumers. And some people use it as well for you know, facilitating e-commerce and things like that. So am I saying you should go and build a chatbot at the moment? I don't know what your competencies are. I don't know what your area of interest is. But this takes me back to what Big Boss said earlier. When he, when he spoke about what pandemic has done, it has prioritized productivity, it has prioritized imagination. So that one is standard, just hold it there. There's it also prioritization of learning. And I think this is where you know, the, the, the need to be deliberate you know, for, for, for people whether you are in, in so-called you know, non-creative economy, because like you said, everybody has to be creative now because without imagination, you can't stand out. And with the disruption that has happened with how work is happening and the environment, you really need something that will help you to stand out. So imagination is there, but learning. So what do you need to learn? So learning is imperative, especially as an individual, right? What are the things that will help you stand out in your area of expertise? Sometimes as well, your area of expertise, you may find that it's becoming, it's no more a hard wall between your area of expertise and other areas of expertise, because suddenly you find that there's a lot of overlap happening. So you may need to, need to learn new things deliberately. I'll round up by giving an example of, of what I mean by that. So let, let's, let's take you know, the average uh, you know, creative guy, you know, creative developer, uh, creative maybe graphics person or something you know, in an agency, right? In today's era, who says he or she does not understand NFTs, right? You may think NFT is tech. Well, it's a medium of engagement. <laughs> so you have to understand it. Maybe the next great idea that you're gonna to give to your client is gonna be in there. So being willing to commit to learning is critical. And like Uncle Femi said, experience is not a thing anymore. Right. Somebody was asking me to advise on someone's you know, resume the other day. And I said, look, you're no longer just looking for years of experience. So is the person's experience relevant to what you need today and even tomorrow? Because now you also have to have an eye on what will the world look like three, four, five years down the line. It's going to be a fun world anyway. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think the summary of that is that technology would remain an enabler remain an enabler that's that's just it okay so um, i don't know if um Uncle Femi, i don't know if you can see the question there's a question that mobology dropped uh maybe i should read it out and then also Kathleen, if you want to also lend a voice to that uh, let me read it out i think uh, um uh, dio tried to i mean he actually addressed you know the large one but it would be good to hear your views on this. yes yeah okay well i think Dio's address quite quite well already. Uh, the whole, I, and I like two buzzwords that I think are very important. 
um, in this new post-COVID era that we're going into. One is Kathleen's um, emphasis on is uh, Dio's emphasis on learning. And, and those two, if you hold them together, you realize that it addresses how you begin to actually make the most in terms of efficiency, productivity, in terms of capacity to actually continuously innovate. Those two things become almost um, holy grail. The idea that you, know, you have to see the opportunity, but you may have to learn how to address, you know, how to, how to engage it. And so it's, it's not a hard wall anymore. It's not, and, and I say this, and when I read the question, I was thinking to myself, we constantly have to make a distinction between what is our disappointments and, and what are our appointments. The idea that you know things are not like we would like it to be, our regulators are not like we would like them to be, the market system is not mature like it should be, but what about the things that we can trigger the things that we can rethink, the ways in which we can, you know, um, reinvent or rethink. And I think it only always takes, you know, uh, that that mindset of opportunity and learning. All right, Kathleen, you want to you want to say something on that? Just quickly that, you know, there's something that always beats my imagination when it comes to um, these, you know, these economic inputs, outputs, is that why is it so difficult sometimes? And I'm not asking, <laughs> not asking a question, it's actually a rhetorical comment um, to understand the benefits um, and to drive the fact that the bottom line itself is the benefit of why we should engage this particular um, industry in this particular way. So the digital, I, you have, we have a lot of stakeholders and by stakeholders, I mean the public, the private sector, mainly always talking about, you know, the digital economy and how, and, and, and the digital economy generates 11.5 trillion of global GDP. We're talking about 15, about 15.5 percent of the global GDP, and in recent years, it has continued to grow at about a 2.5 uh, rate, faster than the global GDP itself. So, at work, in the place of work, I always, you know, coming from a strategic point, I always, you know, justify everything I do by the bottom line. So here's how it's going to make money for you. Here's how you're going to grow. Um, but I find it weird that we have justified this particular industry. Innovation, digital economy has been justified, yet we keep taking steps back instead of actually engaging to ensure that that particular industry drives a huge chunk of, of, of the economy. So, you know, the, the, the kind of transformation that, that, that it can play is, is undeniable. In 2017, the combined market uh, capitalization of digital platforms alone was over seven trillion dollars. They will always change. What will not change is the people and their access to that. So we need to begin to look at the needs and say, okay, what is it that Facebook, Instagram, Zogdog, Spotify? Udemy, Uber, Netflix, Robinhood. What is it that these people are, what are the needs that, that they are responding to, you know, so that we can tap into that and begin to engage and build these things out um, by ourselves. And there's a lot of transformation happening in education, in transportation, in healthcare, in left behind if you know we, we see the creative economy technology as a threat and, and it shouldn't be so oh thank you very much okay mr dara you want to say something yes just taking off from where uh, kathleen ended our conversation so the, there's a very compelling urgency you know 
for 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 the government at a national level and also at a continental level to really be deliberate with how we we unlock the opportunities in in the digital digital economy and this is what happens globally and if you look at a place, place like um uk for instance right they actually have something they call um i mean i i mean somebody while you know advising somebody recently right i learned about something they call uh, tech nation right and tech nation you know is all about deliberately identifying the best resources that will help to develop the digital economy they have KT. so i think clarity is is critical there you know i mean what we can do is we can always advice we can speak we can recommend but then again when you find the opportunity to to start something sometimes you just have to start it right you know that concern about you know regulation always being behind innovation it's always going to remain that way but really we would be better served as a continent if if the african union for instance right had clarity on what to do what is this digital economy because i think that clarity isn't really there so you have institutions like Yali and a couple of other ones doing their own thing, you know, individually, but you need to have something that will, will, will permeate across borders, right? And will be something that is consistent and can, you can also measure because whatever you don't have something to measure about, you know what happens to it after a couple of months, fanfare, it goes away. So, so I think that's, you know, that's, that is critical, right? On a national level, be deliberate. And it's not just about having a ministry of this and that and that, but what is the plan and how is that plan engaging, like I said, collaborative engagement, or let me use create a new one, PCE, proactive collaborative engagement. Let me borrow from, from Kathleen, right? So that you are triggering, you are saying, what will agriculture look like if we bring in technology like this or this kind of ecosystem in the next five years? Yes, we have the individual guys who started all these things, like the farm crowdies and all of these guys who innovated, but we have to be more deliberate, right? You know, I think that is really something critical and we need it, we, we need it. I, I like the fact that the conversation somehow has tilted towards, um, you know, the leadership question, <laughs> the leadership question, because at the end of the day, um, you look at Europe, for instance, um, Europe was not ready to play catch up in terms of technology innovation. What did they do? They found their own space you know, try to create trying to uh, create a better environment you know for platforms to try you know and uh, so really it's a conversation that we must continue to push and then we must continue to have even the regulate the regu regulatory authorities themselves can't be disrupted <laughs> as it were so um, so we will we, we'll have to continue to push the frontiers of this conversation. We are coming to a uh, wrap. Uh, it's been very, very engaging, very, very interesting, very educative. Um, but before we, we go, uh, it would be good for, for you guys to just tell me uh, or your final words around this subject. And then maybe in the process, try to address uh, further. I know we've touched on it a bit, but what what are also some other actionable steps let's look away from the regulators in a bit but what are actionable steps that we can take you know as practitioners to to kind of like develop the creative economy considering the fact that uh, last year it contributed 23 billion dollar to the gdp of nigeria and so how can we begin to grow that because obviously there is a great potential in the sector so what can we do, you know, with or without the regulatory authority? I know there's little we can do without them, but what are those things we can do to find, kind of like create a better environment uh, for, for the creative economy to thrive and grow? Uh, so you can wrap your, your final words, and then if you want to talk on that also, you can. So I start, with, I start with you. I start with you, Kathleen, <laughs> if you don't mind. Okay, uh, thanks, Ugo. I think uh, in terms of, so I don't want to lose, I don't want us to lose sight of, I'm, I'm so passionate about it, maybe because of the advocacy side of me, but I don't want us to lose sight of the 3.7 billion people 
across the world who do not have access to even a basic digital information service, right? Um, so we're not enriching their lives if we, we lose sight of them. I do know that um, there are a lot of organizations that are working towards ensuring that in spite of their lack of access, they still are part of that economy and they can make better decisions for their lives. Dio talked about remote training. I also want to add that there is remote training by IBR that is happening in many, many countries. So I think to answer your question, some of the things that we can do, or well, one of the most important things that we can do, forget the regulators and the policy makers, is that we live on a continent where um, knowledge, the base of our issues is, is literacy. It's important for us to invest in learning, in, in teaching, in ensuring that um, we push for most of these aspects of the creative economy to be part of, of, of curriculum, one way or another, you know? And um, as much as we can teach, we should. So even in my small corner, and what we're doing now is also adding value to people's um, IQ. And I think that is a very fundamental part of how the people themselves will not only add value with the capacity that they have in the different industries that they work in, but also they will also, they will begin to, it will begin to become a pull mechanism rather than a push um, a mechanism all the time. I mean, it's, it's hard to always push those who sign policy. It's, it's hard, but it's easier sometimes to pull them when you have a populace that not only knows, but um, actually delivers. We've seen this happen all the time, maybe even sometimes from the outside in, where we have brilliant Africans who've gone out like Uncle Femi and done so brilliantly, and then the country has finally accepted them because we have no choice, right? And that's, you know, Nollywood is now, Nollywood is now the second highest employer of, 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 of work in Nigeria. So we have no, you know, government, we have no choice. We just have to now empower these people because they're making us shine. I mean, Hugo, I don't know what else to say, but I want to remain on the, on the education and the learning part of it because it, it's one of the things that has made me who I am. I'm kind of multifaceted simply because I spend a lot of time, you know, learning and acquiring knowledge and then pushing it um, back and then it pulling the opportunities uh, back to me. And I think that's that's part of the legacy that some of us will want to leave. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Okay, over to you, Mr. D. Okay. Um, it's quite a, it's quite a, you know, very serious conversation, really, but also exciting at the at the opportunities. As we were talking, you know, I had a flashback of a memory of me as a rookie copywriter, uh, you know, watching the the cam uh, recording from a from a television, you know, doing uh, production, and Femi Odugbemi was the 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 lead producer. So my background was was core creative. Right, because I moved into strategy later. But I had a turning point when I when I worked at V Mobile, right? And I got exposed to see uh, internet data, you know, what was happening to internet data consumption penetration. And really that was the trigger for me to begin to see what was there in technology. Then we didn't call it digital, it was just you know, just a technology, you know. But that was a turning point, and that eventually turned later, years later, into the whole digital agency thing. What am I trying to pull, say with this? So there's there's a, two things. One is that the creative, core creative industry. Let me try to you know permit me to use that phrase. You know, maybe film, you know, creative outputs, development, advertising, marketing related. You 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 need to close the gap with um, with technology sector, right? Because coming up with solutions has to be about people. And technology is a strong enabler if you understand what it can do well. So it, it's important to be able to close that gap and don't just say, oh, this guy is that, you know, this is FinTech over there. FinTech has no, 
no, no, you know, why should I know about fintech? I'm not saying go study fintech, but I'm saying understand what are the things that are affecting the people you want to help, and then look around for what are the, the people you can collaborate with. That was one. Secondly, also has to do with the learning and development thing. When you want to hire people, whether you are in core creative industry or not, you know, also look for people who have certain traits beyond the very typical, you know, things that people put in job, you know, tests and things like. Look for people who are curious, people who who also have some way of thinking about the future, right? People who also care about something that they want to solve some problem because. The people that are going to create innovations typically have some of these kind of, you know, attributes in them, right? Because if you just bring people who can just fix a particular, do a particular job, a particular role, yeah, that's all you will get. <laughs> you know, you're not going to get people that will help you, you know, geometric progression, you know, that will help you accelerate, that will help you go a path not that, 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 that you have not taken, right? So it's about learning, it's about developing your staff, and then you yourself as an individual, man, don't leave yourself behind, <laughs> right? Don't leave yourself behind. Be like Kathleen, you know, <laughs> learn, learn. I'm, I'm learning. I'm taking some courses on uh, EDX, right? You know, on data science. You know, you, do, you got it because that's how the world is, right? That's learning you are taking and will help you develop something. You, you can't stay static. There's no such thing, in fact. You are going to be going backward. That's just the truth. The world. This era of what everything blockchain. Do you know there are so there are like seven different types of chains. You only know blockchain. How would they help you? You want to be an NGO person. You want to set up an NGO. Do you know the role of how those things will help make it easier, faster for you to operate? So you may be going trying to set up an NGO in a very hard way that people used to do 10, 15 years ago. There could be easier, faster ways to do what you want to. So learning, learning, learning. It's okay. Please let me allow. My, my big boss to, to round up for us. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, I think all, all that needs to be said has been said. I'm really very impressed with how you guys have uh, sort of broken this down. Thank you very much. And, and I really would end by just simply saying what I said previously, uh, which is that storytelling is going to be the bridge. We have um, a disenfranchised population, a very large population of people disconnected from the digital infrastructure itself. And they, they are growing. We, the tree keeps enlarging in numbers. And we have this challenge of being able to somehow drag all these people into a vision of a digital future, uh, which is where I think our traditional storytelling industries become critical in terms of foreshadowing for them what that future looks like, what that future um, provides in terms of opportunity, how that future can transform their lives if they focus on creative ideas in learning, on learning, relearning. Um, so Nollywood becomes a very critical um, um, cog in this, not just for entertainment, but for imagination. And I think, you know, that's one of the things that um, I, I keep thinking and talking about because the multi talent factory that I run is, is really like a junction for seeing how the storytellers understand and interconnect and cross fertilize the technology such that they are able to create a vision of the future that allow those who are not able to practically, you know, um, either be formally trained or even um, be able to connect with the tools of, of technology, be able to actually be inspired about what the future holds. And I think that's going to be uh, the key for all of us. And I speak of Nollywood, I also speak of the advertising industry. You'd be stunned. Um, my mom only wanted, um, um, uh, you know, a, a smartphone because of all the stuff she saw people doing with smartphones in the TV ads. And, and, and I mean, you know, there's really hardly anything she was doing with her phone prior to that. But now she's got a WhatsApp group for her children. The whole thing is done in Yoruba language. Everybody is connected to her every day. She gets to spread her prayer first thing in the morning. And if you don't answer, you know, you're in home. So, you know, those sorts of things, there is a way in which technology actually is life and a way in which it helps us to actually um, 
fast track development in such a way that we don't leave too many people behind. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Um, I'm really honored to have been here with you guys. Thank you very much, Uncle Femi. Thank you, Mr. D. Thank you, Kathleen. I mean, we, wouldn't do, we couldn't have started this uh, series better than the way we started it. And I just want to say on behalf of um, the uh, uh, alumni team, I just want to say thank you very much for um, sacrificing your time. It's a public holiday, uh, so you should be resting now, uh, but you sacrifice your time to share from your wealth of um, knowledge and experience. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you very much for, I can't say thank you enough. <laughs> and we look forward to having you uh, more uh, in subsequent editions. Please, I hope you oblige us whenever we call on you. This is, like we said, this is a series. This is something that is going to continue. Uh, so thank you. But I would just want to say for those who are on this call, uh, who are you know graduates of Orange Academy, please feel free to get in touch with us. Or better still, we're going to contact you via the contact details you registered with. And um, we are going to be having our general meetings. And also, uh, we also need more hands. We need more people to join uh, at the center, you know, to kind of like um, help us, you know, bring to life the vision that we have for this alumni association. Um, one of the things that we must all agree on is that Orange Academy is a leader. Orange Academy has been that place where um, creative minds are developed, and I'm a, I'm, I'm, I'm a proud, I'm a proud uh, beneficiary of this initiative. I see it as a movement, not just because we pay to learn, but because everywhere you go across Africa, and you mention Orange Academy, it's like there's a door that is open, and we have a collective responsibility to keep that standard. We have a collective responsibility to keep this vision alive to keep the standard. There is a standard that Orange Academy has set, and it's all our collective responsibility to let it, the light continue to shine. Thank you very much, Fermi, uh, once again. Thank you, Mr. D, and thank you, Kathleen, for your time. Mm -hmm.